Hello dear friends, good to be with you again today. Uh, let's pray before we start. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to look at your word and to study the scriptures that we might be able to know Jesus and know him better, and also that we may know your will for our lives. And so we pray that you would help us and guide us and direct us as, as we look at these scriptures and that we might, at the end of the day, hear your voice. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're, we're in John chapter 8, and I, I'm going to do something I've uh, never done before, <laughs> and, and that is I'm going to skip over some verses. Normally I deal with every single verse, um, but just looking at the passage, um, there, there is quite a bit of repetition. I, I, I don't want you to get the impression that I'm suggesting that the verses that I'm not dealing with are not important. They are important. They are the Word of God. Um, but they are a, a technical argument between Jesus and the Pharisees, and they, they have their particular place in particularly the area of apologetics, improving who Jesus is. Um, but I, I think for our purposes of um, being helpful to the average believer, uh, they, they may not be uh, all that helpful. Um, and, and, and at the same time, I would encourage you to read the verses that I've not dealt with um, and to study them for yourself. Um, I don't believe that, um, that I have much to add to just what the Scripture has to say in those verses. So I, I'm going to jump, uh, first of all, verse 12. So in, in John chapter 8, verse 12, um, Jesus had just um, dealt with the adulterous woman and he told her to go and sin no more. And then verse 12 says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And then I'm going to jump from 12 through to verse 21 and look at 21 through 24. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And then verse 31 through 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. Now how can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is the slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And so let's begin in verse 12, and I want to spend a little bit of time uh, on this verse because this is a very, very important statement that Jesus makes. Remember we said there are seven I am statements uh, in the Gospel of John, and this is the second of those statements. Jesus said to them, I am the light of the world. And of course that I am is the name of God as God revealed himself to Moses in the wilderness. You remember, uh, as Moses sees the burning bush, meets with God and asks God, what is your name? Uh, Who shall I say sent me? And the Lord says to him, I am that I am. Uh, this is the, the divine name, God who is. And so uh, Jesus then uses that uh, name and says that I am the bread of life, uh, we've seen that, and now he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so uh, Jesus is going to speak uh, several more times, uh, or certainly John is going to speak several more times in the gospel about Jesus as the light of the world. Uh, that he is that, and remember that John began the, the uh, uh, book, uh, in chapter 1 already, speaking about Jesus as the light um, that shines in the darkness. The darkness does not overcome it. Men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. So this is a common theme 
throughout the Gospel of John. Uh, now Jesus speaks this context in uh, speaks this uh, these this, uh, these words. This makes a statement in the context of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now we saw that uh, they would uh, fetch the water uh, every morning and they would pour it out uh, on the side of the altar. And Jesus speaks about himself as being that uh, that water uh, that if you drink of me. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke about the Holy Spirit. But the other thing that would happen during this feast is that in the evenings, uh, they would light uh, four big uh, lanterns um, or uh, torches um, uh, in the, uh, on the edges of the, of the temple. A uh, young man would climb up there, and um, historians tell us uh, each one of these lamps would hold 65 liters of oil. Um, that, that's an uh, enormous amount of oil. I didn't do the conversion, but it's about 20 gallons. Um, yeah, so it's almost 20, uh, 18 to 20 gallons of oil. Uh, they would, uh, young, strong priests would climb up, and they would pour the oil in, and they would lamp, uh, light the wicks, and these, uh, these, these lights would give light to the whole of the temple uh, area, uh, the, uh, all the various courts of the temple, and much of Jerusalem would be lit up as a result of these huge lights uh, that would burn during the time of the feast. Um, and so it's in that context that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And while they may relish in the light uh, that the temple gave in those four big lamps that would be lit or four big torches that would be lit. Um, at the same time, uh, they would have many lights in their, uh, in their houses. Uh, this would be uh, s uh, sort of an, um, I, I hate to draw that equivalent, but Diwali, the Hindus have the festival of lights and they light many, many lamps. Um, it's the same sort of thing, although there's really no connection between these uh, between this uh, pagan festival um, and, uh, and and what these guys were doing, what the Jews were doing. Um, and so Jesus says that, you know, you, you, you revel in these lights, uh, but I am the light of the world. Um, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, uh, the, the, the context of the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, the purpose of the uh, Feast of Tabernacles was to remind Israel that they walk, lived in the wilderness for 40 years in tents. Um, and so they uh, had to go out and live in these, uh, in these booths or these little uh, lean-tos or shacks that they would build uh, through which you could see the outside world and see the stars, so really providing very, very little cover, maybe a little bit of shade during the day, and that's about it. Um, but they, they lived in there for, for the seven days, and this was a reminder of the fact that they passed through the wilderness and they lived in tents for that 40 years. One of the things that happened in that 40 years was that God provided water for them, and that water came out of the rock. As Moses uh, smote the rock the first time, was supposed to speak to it the second time, um, but uh, struck it again the second time. And the book of Corinthians tells us that that rock was Christ. Um, and I'm not going to get uh, sidetracked into a discussion of Moses speaking and, uh, and, and not speaking, but striking the, the rock. But, uh, but Corinthians tells us that that rock was Christ. And interestingly enough, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that uh, that rock followed them uh, in the wilderness. Now, I, I don't fully understand, but I believe what the Scripture says, and that seems that uh, it wasn't just a, on one occasion that they came to a rock and water came out of the rock, but it, it seems that that rock was there wherever they camped, and water was constantly gushing from this rock in order to provide for them uh, their, their, their drink, but also providing manna. Now, Jesus had already had spoken about the manna and said that your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, they died, uh, but if you eat the bread that I give you and the bread that he was giving was himself, uh, you would sp that will spring up to eternal life. So Jesus had already, in, this, in the same context, spoken about the manna, he had spoken about the water that came out of the rock, 
But now he is speaking about the third thing that was uh, um, unique to the wilderness experience, and that was the light. And so you'll remember that there was a pillar of cloud that would overshadow them during the day, and that would turn into a pillar of fire during the night. Uh, during the day, the cloud sheltered them from the sun. Um, the Sinai uh, Peninsula and the, uh, the desert there it gets very, very hot, can get up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, don't know what that is in Celsius, probably 50 maybe are in that area. Very, very hot. And uh, uh, without the shelter of the cloud, they would have, uh, they would have died of the heat. Um, but at night, this would turn into a pillar of fire, and that would light up the camp um, and give them light um, and also give them heat uh, during the night because in the desert, it gets very cold at night. Now, the, 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 the pillar of fire and the cloud um, did several other things for them. Um, the main thing that it did, well, I, hard to say which was the main thing, but one of the most important aspects of the, the cloud and the pillar was that, they, that that was what led them. So when the cloud lifted, they knew it was time to pack up and to get ready to move. And then the cloud would, would direct them, um, and the, um, the, the priests carrying the tabernacle um, and the Ark of the Covenant uh, leading the people of Israel under the cloud, and they would move as long as the cloud was moving. And then when the cloud would stop, uh, they would uh, uh, pitch the tent of the tabernacle, and the people of Israel would camp around uh, the, each of the tribes in their designated spot on each side of the, uh, of the tabernacle. Um, and so this was God's leading. This was the way that God led them, the way that God directed them. And then they also provided protection from the enemies. And remember when they came out of Egypt, uh, they went through the Red Sea and the uh, Pharaoh's army pursued them uh, and the cloud moved to go behind the people of Israel and became sort of a smokescreen, if you will, between uh, the uh, Egyptians and the Israelites. So the Egyptians could not see the Israelites and pursue them. Um, and so, uh, but it would also, the pillar of fire at night would protect them uh, from, uh, the, uh, from wild animals. Um, and we know that even today, those people who camp in the wilderness areas uh, will light a fire to keep uh, predators away. Um, and so it would provide protection for them. Uh, and, and so Jesus is now saying that your fathers ate the manna and they, they are, they've died. Your, your fathers drank the water that came from the rock, um, but I'm going to give you water that will spring up to eternal life. I will give you the manna, and you will never hunger again. And now Jesus is saying, your fathers uh, enjoyed the, the, the blessings of the pillar of fire and the cloud during the day, and yet I am the fulfillment of those prophecies, the fulfillment of those pictures and types and shadows of the Old Testament. Uh, they've pointed to me, and I am the ultimate light of the world, um, and I give light to those who will come to me. And so Jesus, in providing the light of the world, um, he says, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Notice, uh, he, he doesn't say those who walk in my light, but those who follow me, the same way as the people of Israel followed the pillar of fire and the cloud. Um, they, they, the, during, the, during the day, um, they, that, that was what would lead them. They couldn't go ahead of them, of, of the pillar or the cloud. They couldn't stay too far behind. In fact, you remember there were some who, who did uh, uh, um, straggle and, and ended up way behind, and they fell prey to the Amalekites and to the enemies. Uh, so you needed to stay right there where the cloud was moving. And Jesus is saying, they followed the cloud. You need to follow me. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Um, that, that light does not, the light of God and of his word does not extend to light up the whole world in that sense. It only lights up where God wants us to be. If you walk away from God, there's no light there. You're going to be find yourself in darkness. Uh, so you need to be walking close to Jesus. 
that you might be able to enjoy the benefits and the blessing and the protection of the light uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so the same way as for the uh, Israelites, uh, the light protects us, uh, the light warms us, uh, comforts us, the light lights our way so that we might be able to see, um, and the, the light uh, guards us against the, the enemies. And so uh, it gives us light to be able to see and understand the attacks that may be coming against us. And so we, we need to be walking in that light. Uh, we're, we're not camping in that light so much as we're walking in the light. And so I have to ask you the question, are you walking in that light? John tells us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us of all sin or all unrighteousness. And so Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Now, in verse 21, so we're jumping down to verse 21, and Jesus said to them again, I'm going away, and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. Now, for, for us, it's easy because we're able to look uh, with a benefit of hindsight, and we know that what Jesus was talking about was his ascension. He was talking about the cross where no one else was going to go with him in the cross. He alone had to, had to die there, uh, but then he would be buried, rise, and then he would ascend to, back to the Father. So he's talking about his ascension, and he's saying, where I'm going, I'm going to the Father, and he says, you cannot come where I am. Now, why can, can they not come where he is? Because they will die in their sin. We, we know the promise is to us as believers to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus says to the thief on the, on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And so, and so we have this promise that we, that we can be with him. And we're going to come to chapter 14 eventually where Jesus says, I go away to prepare a place for, uh, for you, that where I am, you may be also. So for the believer, there is no uh, fear that he's going to go away and leave us alone, uh, but that where he is, we're going to be. Uh, but the unbeliever cannot go to where he is. And of course, this is one of the big uh, deceptions of our modern times. Uh, it wasn't always so. Certainly when I was younger, it wasn't an issue. Uh, but, but in these last uh, 10 years or so, uh, I'm just uh, increasingly all the time hearing about this, uh, this unbeliever uh, and that unbeliever. Oh, they're, they're in heaven or they're up there. They, they're looking down on us or, or, or uh, the, this uh, foul-mouthed um, uh, um, uh, comedian. Um, oh, you know, God needed a laugh in heaven, so he's up there with God. No, sinners cannot enter into his presence. And that's what Jesus is saying. You will seek me and you will die in your sin. And where I go, you cannot come. So the Jew said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. So is he going to commit suicide? They, they have no clue. Uh, these guys. And, 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 you know, when I look at some people today, uh, even those who profess to be Christians, who, who have no clue about the things of God, who have no idea of, of what the Bible is all about, or what Jesus is saying, or what God's Word says, uh, because they are not born again. They don't have the light of the Word. Um, and when Jesus says, I am the light, uh, he, he, he enlightens us that we might be able to see and understand spiritual truth. Um, and so these guys are in darkness. They don't, they, they don't see anything. They don't understand anything. Everything is in terms of material, here and now, uh, physical things. Uh, they cannot understand the, the idea of, of heaven um, and of Jesus being in the presence of the, uh, of the Father. Of course, they, they didn't even believe that he was uh, the Son of God. And then verse 23, and he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. 
I am not of this world. And of course, I, I don't have to elaborate on on those those uh, verse that verse. It's it's so uh, so very clear. Uh, they you are from beneath. You are from uh, this world, um, but I am from above. Now later on, and I think we'll get to this next week. Um, Jesus speaks about the fact that you are of your father, the devil. So when he says you're from beneath, he's really meaning from this earth. But uh, there, there may be an allusion to the fact that they are not even from this earth. They are from, uh, from, from hell, as it were, because that is where they destined to go. Um, and that is the, 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 their father is, uh, is the devil um, uh, from the pit. Um, but he says to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. The, the fact that Jesus descended from the Father, uh, they just could not uh, understand that. Verse 24, uh, he says, therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they, they needed to believe that Jesus is in fact God, that he is the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, uh, whichever term you, uh, you prefer. And if you did not believe in that in him, uh, there you, you would die. Whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, I, I must address very briefly a, a heresy which is uh, being taught uh, by uh, some very popular preachers here in America and elsewhere. They, uh, the others pick it up from, from the Americans, I, I think, um, that uh, the Jews uh, are saved because of the covenant. Um, they, they don't have to believe in Jesus. Uh, they are saved because they are God's people. No, Jesus here is speaking to the Jews. He's speaking to his covenant people. Um, and he is saying to them that if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. It's plain and simple. There is no salvation for anyone, Jew, Gentile, uh, the pagan in the bush who has never heard the gospel um, the, or claims to never heard the gospel, there is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ, not even for the Jews. And you say, well, what about the fact that the, the book of Romans says that at the end, all of Israel will be saved? Well, on what basis will they be saved? Not on the basis of a covenant. They will be saved on the basis that they have seen Jesus they, and they, they see him whom they have pierced. And it says they will weep for, as one weeps for an only son. And so when they see and recognize Jesus as their Messiah, it is then that Israel is saved. And remember, Israel is not saved as a nation, but the individuals are saved. No nation, even Israel, was ever saved because of nationhood or ethnicity. They are saved because of each individual coming to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so now I'm going to jump down to verse 31. And in verse 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Now, notice the word Jews. And I've said to you before that when John uses the word Jews, he's meaning primarily the Jewish leaders, um, the Samaritans, uh, sorry, the uh, Sadducees, the Pharisees, uh, the scribes, um, the, the, the rabbis, the teachers, the leaders of Israel. And so it seems then that there were some of them who believed. Uh, this may be uh, Joseph of Arimathea, remember, who at the end comes to claim the body of Jesus. He may have been amongst these people. Uh, we don't know. But also, it is very clear from the context that their, most of these people's faith didn't last very long because uh, Jesus uh, speaks to them here, and, and John says they believed in, uh, believed him, um, and then in a few verses' time, he's going to rebuke them again um, as unbelievers. Um, so, so it seems that the, their faith didn't, particularly, uh, didn't last particularly long. But uh, he, he, the, So they, they believed in him. 
uh, they believed him. They believed his testimony, his testimony that he is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, uh, that he is, in fact, God. And so he says to them, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So is it possible to believe and not be a disciple indeed? Well, I think this verse is saying that, uh, that there were these people who believed him, but they were not necessarily his disciples indeed. And why were they not his disciples indeed? because they did not abide in his word. There are many who receive the word of God with gladness. Remember the seed that falls in the different kinds of ground. But then when persecution comes, the seed disappears. When the hard times come, when the sun comes up and the, and the heat of the day, the seed uh, wilts and dies. But those who abide in his word, and that, that word abide means to remain in his word. We're going to find this word again later on in the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus says that we abide in me and I in you. But here he's not speaking about abiding in Jesus, but he's speaking about abiding in his word, remaining in his word. Now, it does not just mean reading his word, because, and that's the problem with using that word remain, because it's, uh, it can easily be understood that when I'm saying you need to remain in the Word of God, it means you need to be staying in the Word. You need to be reading the Word. That's what we normally mean when we say stay in the Word. No, this is far more than just uh, reading. This means obeying the Word, remaining obedient to the Word. This is more than just reading. Um, and so as we remain in the word, as we remain reading and believing and following and obeying the word, that is how we abide in the word. And so if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. There are many who claim to believe on the Lord Jesus today, but the question is, do they stay in the word of God? Do they read and obey the word of God. Um, remember, it's not just about knowing stuff. It's not even knowing the Bible. Uh, the great commission that Jesus gives us in Matthew 28 is that we are to make disciples, teaching them to observe, to do whatever I have commanded. Not just teaching them to know, but teaching them to observe. There are many who may be listening to me today, uh, who, who love the Word of God, who love to study the Word of God, love to listen to teachers um, about the Word of God. That is not the point. The point is, are you doing what the God's Word says? Are you living according to the Word of God? Are you remaining in the Word of God in the sense that it's not like you read, read the passages and you put the book aside and now you go your merry way? No, you need to be living in the Word in the sense that what the Word says is where you're going to be in, where you're going to be at uh, as you walk through your day, that you're never walking outside or away from the Word of God, but you're walking in the Word of God, obeying the Word of God, moment for my, by moment, step by step, as you follow Him. And He says, then you are my disciples indeed. And, and, I, and, and I want to emphasize this, because, and I probably sound a little frustrated about this, but I, I am frustrated by the number of people who, who know the Bible but don't live the Bible. They're not abiding in, uh, in the Word, uh, and they are not His disciples. They, now, uh, is there a difference between believers and disciples? Well, I don't know. Maybe there is. It seems in this context there is because uh, there are. Those, they, he says, you you believe, but if unless you remain in my word, you're not my disciple. Remember, a disciple is a follower, a disciplined one, a one who has been trained. Um, it's it's no good just by saying, yeah, I believe, but are you living in the word? All right. Now, verse thirty-two. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, this is a very misused verse, of course. 
But le let's just look at the beginning of the verse because it begins with the word and. So, and what? If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth. How will we know the truth? If we abide in his word. You will not find the truth on the television or in the newscast or on Facebook or on uh, any kind, any of the, of the many uh, um, news media or um, uh, various programs that profess to have, to, to speak the truth. In fact, there's one here in America called, uh, which has truth in its name, uh, and there's very little truth there. Uh, how will we know the truth? We know the truth when we abide in his word. Um, not just read his word, but obey his word. And remember, Jesus establishes a principle that as we receive and obey his word, he gives us more light, more revelation, more understanding. And the more we understand, the more we obey, the more understanding we get. If we disobey, then he takes from us even what we, what we had. Um, and so th there's a need for us to remain in the word, and then we will know the truth. This does not, this is not a political statement. Political politicians like to use this word and say, yeah, yeah, we, we you know, we're, we're, we're telling you that this is the truth and the truth will make you free. Or it's, it's often used concerning criminals, uh, that if they'll speak the truth, then the, the truth will make them free. Um, uh, that's not what Jesus said. And I'm not going to comment. There may be merits in those ideas. I, I, I don't even want to. Uh, waste time on that. That's Jesus is not talking here about truth as an everyday truth, uh, or yeah, just an any uh, an everyday form of truth. Uh, today uh, is Friday, or uh, the sun is shining, or whatever. That 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 truth is not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about himself. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. And when he says you will know the truth, he is not saying you will know the difference between the truth of one political party versus the lies of another. They all lie, by the way. That's not what he says. When you will know the truth, he says you will know me. I am the truth. Remember, as Jesus stands before Pilate, Pilate says to him, what is truth? And he doesn't understand and recognize that truth was standing right in front of him. Now, we'll see later on in the chapter, and I don't know that we, we will get there today, but later on in the chapter, Jesus speaks about the devil as being the father of lies. But Jesus is truth. These, these are the polar opposites. This is why Christians need to speak the truth on everyday matters and on doctrinal matters uh, because we represent him who is truth. And when we lie about everyday things, then we are associating with the devil who is the father of lies. And that's why the book of Revelation says that no liar will enter into the new Jerusalem. This is, this is so serious. So at the very core of who Jesus is, is this aspect of truth. The very core of who the devil is, is lies. Jesus always speaks truth. He never lies. The devil never speaks truth. And even when he speaks truth, it is a lie because he is trying to use the truth as a, as a, as a hook to be able to, to catch you uh, in order to sell you on a lie. And so as Christians, we should be walking in the truth speaking truth. So it's, it's not knowing the truth about politics. It's not knowing the truth even about doctrine that will set us free. It is knowing Jesus that sets us free. Now, let me put those two verses together again, because we, we only quote verse 32 without the context. Verse 31, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And so as we remain in his word, remember not just studying, but obeying his word, 
we will know him, the truth, and he will make us free. Truth is not a, um, a magic formula that somehow makes us free. It's Jesus who makes us free. And remember, that's his name. You will call his name Jesus because he will save his people out of their sins. He has come to deliver us out of sins. Um, we, we, we are bound by sin, and Jesus is going to speak about that in a moment. And so what is the truth? What does Jesus make us free from? He makes us free from the bondage of sin. So let's go to verse 33. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Now, again, remember, it wasn't long ago Jesus said to them, you are from beneath. In other words, that's where you come from and that's where your minds are. They are earthbound, they are earthly. You can only think about things in, in earthly terms. And again, Jesus is speaking about spiritual liberty, but they immediately think about political liberty, being politically free. And we see the same problem today, that so many of the scriptures that, that apply to us in a spiritual sense is applied to America in a political sense. There's a monument in Los Angeles that I would visit from time to time, and whenever we had visitors, we would take them to go and see this, this great mosaic, one of the biggest mosaics in the world, tells the history of America. But, but on, the, on the top left-hand corner, is this is this this verse which says stand fast in the liberty the liberty we have is not political liberty it's not liberty from political oppression it's polit it's liberty from sin the scripture is not concerned about whether we are slaves or free not concerned whether we are in nations that are free or nations that are uh, in in bondage to others but it's concerned with our spiritual freedom. And so they say we are Abraham's descendants, Abraham's seed, and we have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? And of course, we know that this is part of the Jewish mindset running through to today, this, this fierce independence and, and, and the idea that we, are, we, we will not be subject to anyone. Uh, but... Uh, it's amazing that when you, when you don't see things from God's perspective, how blind you become uh, to, to the truth. Uh, and so they say, we have never been in bondage to anyone. They'd forgotten about Egypt, where they were for 400 years. They'd forgotten about the Assyrian captivity. They'd forgotten about the Babylonian captivity. They'd forgotten that they were under the, the Greek uh, domination and that they were now under Roman domination and would continue under Roman domination for hundreds of years. They were not free. And yet they say, we're, we're free. How can you, can you see the problem? The moment you begin to get away from God's intention for us with his word, in other words, when God speaks to us about spiritual liberty, and we begin to try and apply that to uh, a political situation or a social status, uh, slaves versus free, the moment we try and apply those things, it all falls apart. And we, we, we just don't see the truth. We just don't understand what's what. Uh, Israel I haven't done the sums, but but I I seem to think that up to this point, when Jesus is uh, is walking on the streets of Galilee or in Jerusalem at this point, that that Israel probably was in captivity as much as they were ever free, maybe more. And yet their whole emphasis is we've never been in bondage to anyone, and of course uh, they they totally missed the point. Uh, Jesus is not talking about that. Jesus answered them and said. Uh, most assuredly, I say to you, verily, verily, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. 
Now, remember that he had spoken about the, the woman and uh, who committed adultery, and he says, if any of you without sin, let him cast the first stone. And uh, none of them were able to cast the first stone, so they recognized that they were sinners. But now Jesus is saying, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Sin enslaves us. You commit the first one, and they, you have to do the next one, and the next one, and the next one. All sin is like that, not just addictions. We say, well, you know, that's what alcohol and drugs and gambling and, and, and those kinds of things do is they, you know, you, you, you get hooked, and then you, uh, you can't stop doing it. No sin by its very nature. And notice Jesus is not saying who commits sins is a slave of sins. He's not dealing with specific addictions. He's dealing with sin as a principle. And when we are sinners, we are addicted and enslaved by sin. We cannot do the right thing. And it's a waste of time to try and convert, or, or not convert, but to try and uh, change society by changing laws and trying to force people to be moral. Because people cannot be moral, because they are sinners and they are enslaved by their sin. But Jesus has come to set us free. And then he says, a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. You, you see, I, I think if we go back, when we look at the idea of sin, we have the we we sometimes think that sin can be a servant to me, or, or maybe sin is an employer, and I can resign and walk out. No, sin is not my employee, and sin is not my employer that I can resign from. Sin is a slave master, and Paul picks this up in the book of Romans as well. And he, he gives us all of the theological background to the whole concept of how that we were enslaved by, and by sin, but we have been set free that we might walk in newness of life and serve the Lord. Um, and so a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. And so he is, Jesus is now saying, if you sin, if you're a sinner, you are a slave. And a slave has no property rights. Slave doesn't go to heaven, just in plain language. A sinner does not go to heaven. But a son abides forever. What house is he talking about? He's talking about the household of faith. He's talking about the house of God. He's talking about heaven. And so those who are enslaved by sin don't stay. Slaves can be sold to another master, but the son can never be disowned. And so the question today is again, are you, are you a slave of sin? And I'm, I'm not meaning as Christians that we don't sin. Of course, we know John says if we, that we all sin. We know that, but we have an advocate with the Father. But are we enslaved by sin? Because Jesus has come to set us free. He's come to save us out of our sin and to deliver us that we might be set free to serve and to love God. Now, my last verse this morning, uh, sorry, today is, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. You see, th there are many self-help books. There are many courses you can attend. There are many psychologists and motivational speakers who try and provide some kind of way in which you can manage your life. In fact, you will never know freedom from sin unless Jesus has made you free. You can try and make New Year's resolutions. You can try and modify your behavior. You can work very hard. And I know that there are many unbelievers who successfully uh, broken the bondage of, um, of drug addiction or alcohol addiction and, uh, and, and so on. But it's, it's, it's not just getting free of of alcohol and drugs. It's free from the whole concept of sin, thinking the wrong thoughts, having the wrong desires, having the wrong ambitions, 
reacting in the wrong way. That's Because that's who we are. And the only way we can get out of that is if he makes us free. And how does he make us free? He makes us free by causing us to be born again. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The power of the gospel lies in its ability to set us free from sin. doesn't mean that we won't sin, but it means that we don't have to sin. You see, that's the difference is an unbeliever has to sin. He has no choice. He is bound. He is the slave, enslaved to sin. The believer does not have to sin. He can walk free. Now, I'm not preaching sin as perfection. I, I've just quoted John's first epistle that we, we all sin, but we don't have to sin. And we can walk in liberty, and we can continue to walk in liberty, and sin shall not have dominion over us. Sin shall not rule us and reign over us and control us. I want you to be free, my brother and my sister. But there's only one who can set you free. There's no deliverance preacher. There's no deliverance campaign that can set you free. There's no preacher who can zap you and you fall over and now you've been delivered. It's only Jesus who can set you free. And remember the context. There's a sequence of things. If we believe, then we abide in his word. And if we abide in his word, we will know him. And if we know him, he will set us free. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus who has come to do the impossible, and that is to set us free from the bondage and the entrapment and the enslavement of sin. Lord, that which no man has ever been able to do, Jesus did for us as he broke the power, as the hymn writer says, the power of, he broke the power of cancelled sin and set the prisoner free. Lord, I pray that for those who are watching today, that if there are those who are bound by sin or specific sins, I pray, Lord, that you would give them what they need to be set free, that they may abide in your word, that they may know you, and that they may be set free. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you.